Excellent. How are you enjoying the conference? Woo! Okay, so I've I've been to a bunch of talks today, and oh my gosh, they were so good. So I hope you picked the same talks, and they were just as good, or the other ones were just as good. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, my name is Franziska Hinkelmann, and I'll talk about JavaScript compilers, specifically V8. So um, there were already a bunch of JavaScript talks today, and I want to show you a little bit of what's happening under the hood at the compiler level in JavaScript. We'll see how modern JavaScript performance compares to C++ performance, and then we'll see where WebAssembly fits into this performance story. Um, the concepts that I'm showing you, they are fundamental JavaScript concepts, and they apply no matter what framework you're using. So it doesn't matter if you're using Angular or Vue or React or Node.js, the basic concepts, they apply to all these languages. And who here is a PHP developer? OK. Don't leave the room. Stay here. <laughs> so even though I'm talking specifically about the V8 engine, for JavaScript, um, the basic concepts are the same for all just-in-time compilers. So the, the modern JavaScript engines, they all have a just-in-time compiler, and we'll look at how that works, what it means, and why it makes JavaScript so fast. And PHP 8 is coming out, and it will have a just-in-time compiler. So you're learning some basic concepts here of the compiler that's not even shipped yet. And fun fact, I actually got interested in compilers and JavaScript compilers and ended up on the Chrome team because I went to a PHP conference and Sarah Gollamon was talking about Hip Hop VM and Hack and how that compiler works and that got me to dig into how it works for JavaScript. So maybe someday you add to PHP core to the con compiler because you went to a JavaScript talk. <laughs> All right, so I'll speak about performance, and there's lots of parts that affect performance of an application. Um, and, but I will only talk about the runtime performance of JavaScript itself. So I will not talk about I.O. or images or how different databases and different queries, HTTP or rendering, fonts, the network, how all of that affects your application. Um, if you went to Jaslyn's talk this morning, she talked about performance optimization, or she mentioned Lighthouse, and she gave a lot of really good and useful practical advice. I will not give you that. So um, my talk is a lot less practical, but I think it's always good to have some idea of what's happening under the hood. Now, why am I saying it's a lot less practical? Um, when you want to optimize at the, at the compiler level, there's usually 50 other steps that you need to optimize first. Like if you ship slightly smaller images, your improvements are so much bigger than any compiler optimization you could make. So we will look at how fast is JavaScript, like computing something in JavaScript, not all the other parts that affect your application. Then we see how fast is C++, specifically a C++ add-on that you can use in Node.js. And we'll see how fast is the, the C++ code compiled to WebAssembly in comparison. Whenever we talk about performance and optimization, that comes with a huge warning. <laughs> don't ever blindly optimize. That's the worst thing you can do to yourself because you have to work with that code and to your coworkers because they also have to fix and maintain that code that you optimized. Um, always, always measure. Only make performance improvements if you actually have a problem. If nobody complains that your app is too fast, if you're not losing revenue, don't start making it faster. And then if, if somebody has decided, yep, we need to be a little faster, really make sure you measure and you find the bottlenecks and then improve those bottlenecks. Don't go in blindly and say, oh, I heard something about compilers, so now I'm changing every if statement to something else or something like that. Don't do that. Measure, keep measuring before and after your performance improvements. All right, so all the warnings out of the way. Let's look at some fundamental differences between JavaScript and C++, so we'll see why it is so hard to make JavaScript fast. And it's very similar in PHP, as that's also a scripting language. Um, and also, we just do very basic JavaScript. So if you're not a JavaScript expert, no problem. I'm, sh I'm sure you can follow along. So in JavaScript, I can write code like this. I can create an object, and I can define the x property of this object to be 42. Can I do the same thing in C++? 
pretty much um, there's one step I have to do before I can create an object. I first have to tell the compiler this is what objects look like, so I define a class. Um, this class has a field x, that's a, an integer. And once I have this, I can instantiate the object and I can set the property x to 42. Exactly the same line, this last one in JavaScript. All right. So now, JavaScript, I can also say, oh, object.y is 17, right? This will run just fine. What if I do this in C++? Um, I can't even compile that. A compiler is like, nope, sorry. You told me this object looks like this, and there's no y on it, so I'm out of here. I'm not doing this. So JavaScript, the types in JavaScript, they're dynamic. I can dynamically set the X property, set a Y property, delete the X property, change what the X property is. It doesn't need to be an integer. It can be a string or another object. In C++, the types are very static. You give the compiler this blueprint where you say, this is my class, and then that's exactly the type. There's no wiggling it. So we call JavaScript a dynamically typed language, where something like C++ is statically typed. The big advantage of dynamically typed languages is it's often a little bit easier when you first learn it. Um, things like prototyping, you can always often do them faster. And then there are some data types that are just really hard to work with in a statically typed language. Like if you get a bunch of JSON over the wire in JavaScript done, you pass this into an object. Um, in, in C++, that's not as easy because as soon as the sender changes one or two fields in the JSON, it doesn't fit your, your object anymore. So JavaScript is great for those kind of things. Um, at the same time, though, it's a little more work for the compiler because everything is so dynamic and you don't have to say up front, this is what my object looks like, compiler. The compiler has to do a lot of work to keep up with you. So let's look at something super simple. Let's look at a property lookup. And you have this everywhere in your code. Whenever you have a dot, it's a property lookup. So here we're looking up the property x on the object object. Even if you just do console.log, you're looking up the log property on the console object. So property looks up all over your JavaScript code. Now, for us, it's super simple conceptually. Oh, I just use x of this object. But for the JavaScript compilers, there's lots of things that could happen and that it all has to take into account. This could be a type error, could be undefined. Um, x could be undefined on the object, but be defined somewhere further up on the prototype chain. X could have been defined as a proxy with a get trap, or X could have been defined via an accessor descriptor, so any side effects can happen when you look up X. And even if object.x is just a property, if X is just a property on the object, the compiler doesn't know upfront where in the memory the property that value of X is. So if something this simple is so much work for a compiler, is this what JavaScript is? Let's look at data. So I calculated prime numbers here, the first one million, I think. And I used the exact same algorithm in C++ and in JavaScript, so no difference here in the algorithm. Of course, there's lots you can do with a better or different algorithm, but it's exactly the same algorithm. So both these calculations do exactly the same work, just in C++ and JavaScript. Um, left to right, is as the prime numbers get bigger, and then bottom to top, you see how many seconds it takes to calculate the larger prime numbers. And the red line is C++. So yes, you see C++ is faster than JavaScript, but this is a linear scale, and JavaScript is maybe twice as slow as C++. So it's, it's really close to it. Like It's in the same ballpark. If you think back to this other slide, just a property lookup is so much work for the compiler. It's amazing that we have the speed that's almost the same, just a factor too slower. And in a little bit, we'll look at how, how much, much slower JavaScript used to be 10 years ago in comparison to C++. So this might not look all that impressive, but it really is impressive if you, look, if you consider that JavaScript is a dynamically typed scripting language. All right, let's dig in. How can JavaScript be this fast? How, do we, how can we calculate prime numbers just twice as slow as C++ native speed? So the, the trick that all modern JavaScript engines use is they have a just-in-time compiler, a JIT. 
Um, the just-in-time compilers, they are lazy compilers. They compile just in time as they run the code. So they don't do a compilation upfront ahead of time of everything and then run it. They compile a little bit of code and they run it and they see, oh, now I have to use this code, so I compile it and then they run this. So they're very lazy just doing the bare minimum as they need it. Um, how can this be fast? Usually if something is lazy, it's very slow. Well, the, the big advantage of being a just-in-time compiler is that because they don't compile everything up front, the just-in-time compilers, they alternate between compile time and runtime. Those, those two steps, it, it goes back and forth between compiling and running the code. And that has the big advantage that the just-in-time compiler can get information or feedback at runtime about the code and then use this information when it does another compilation step. If you do all the compilation up front, you cannot use any information from the runtime to make this compilation better. So just-in-time compilers, they go back and forth between compiling and running the, the executable code, and then they collect information while they run the code and use it to generate even better machine code. So typically, um, your compilers look like this. You start with source code, no surprise. And then you have a, a parser part of your compiler that parses that source code usually into an abstract syntax tree, an AST. So an AST is just a different representation of source code. Source code is for us humans to read and write, and an AST is easier to digest by a machine. So the parser parses the source code, and then the interpreter or compiler depends on the language and the context, what would you use? The compiler then compiles this abstract syntax tree into machine code that you can then execute. Now, for just-in-time compilers, it's not a straightforward linear line anymore. For just-in-time compilers, we go back and forth here between uh, the just-in-time compiler and the machine code. And modern engines, they don't get this super fast performance that almost as fast as C++ by having just one just-in-time compiler. Um, all the modern engines have at least two compilers. So they have a baseline compiler, and then they have an optimizing just-in-time compiler. And the trick here is that the, if a function is hot, if a function is being run a lot of times, then the compiler considers it hot, and then it's being passed on to the optimizing compiler, and that one then recompiles this function using a speculation that is based on the information collected at runtime before. And if the compiler, if that speculation was wrong, then it de-optimizes back to the baseline compiler. So V8 has Turbofan as its optimizing compiler, got introduced in 2017, but we had Crankshaft since 2010, that was the first optimizing compiler we had. Chakra and Microsoft Edge had the full JIT compiler since 2014. Um, Safari has two optimizing compilers, DFG and B3, and then Firefox since 2013 has IonMonkey. All right, so maybe that was a little bit abstract, so let's look at some actual code and try to match that picture to some code. So here's a simple function, uh, add. It takes as input an object, and then it calculates one plus the x property of this object. So I think even after the beers you had at a reception, this still makes sense, right? All right, so when we want to run our code and we're actually calling this function, then the compiler is like, oh, I have to compile this function so I can run it. Um, in JavaScript, if you have code for a function but you never execute it, it doesn't even get compiled. So in, in our a schematic of a graph uh, of a compiler. We start with source code, parser turns it into an abstract syntax tree, and now if somewhere in your code, if, if we come to the point where we're executing this add function, then the baseline compiler compiles it to machine code, and we run this machine code with the different inputs. So here we would get back 43, 8, and 124. 
All right. Now, if we keep running this function lots of times, at some point the compiler will say, whoa, this add function is being executed a ton of times. We have certain heuristics when that is, and it'll pass it on to the second compiler, to the optimizing compiler. So now the optimizing compiler will recompile the add function, but the big bonus is that we have information because we already ran this function a ton of time. And the, the information that's important here for us is the kind of input that this function was called. Um, every time we call this function on the left, the parameter always looks the same, right? It's not the same values, but it looks the same. It's an object that has an X, not on a prototype chain, directly on the object, and that X is a number. So the optimizing compiler is like, hmm, I've seen this a ton of times. I'm going to speculate now that in the future, this add function will be called again with objects that just look like this. So it's using this speculation, and it generates machine code that now is a lot faster than the one on the left side. All right. Of course, just because you've called a function a bunch of times with some kind of input doesn't mean that this doesn't change all of a sudden. What happens if somewhere else in your code this line comes along now? Well, if we use this optimized machine code for this input, we would actually get nonsense results out of it. But the optimizing compiler is smart. It knew what assumption it makes, and it realizes that this input violates the assumption it made. So instead, it de-optimizes. It says, oh, I can't do this. And it de-optimizes it and passes it back to the baseline compiler. So we're using this slower baseline machine code, but at least it's correct. All right, so here's the x86 assembly code that is generated from the baseline compiler on the left, and it actually runs on for a few more pages, but it couldn't fit all of that. And on the right-hand side, you see the x86 assembly code, just these four instructions that are generated from the optimizing compiler under the assumption that the input always looked like a um, regular object just with an x property. Um, so all instructions roughly take the same time to execute, so it's pretty obvious running, executing hundreds of instructions is a lot slower than executing four instructions. Okay, who wants to decode with me what these four lines mean? I know it's, it's late and dark outside, but it's, it might be still light, but it's, it's really not that hard, so let's try. So the first one is CMP. That stands for compare. So what we're comparing here is that the, the format, the shape of the input matches our speculation. So we kind of have a hash code for the different shapes, and we're just checking what came in matches that code that we expected in our speculation. If that's not the case, then in the next line we do a jump, J and Z. We're jumping, we're bailing out um, basically to the left side to these hundreds of instructions, because if the speculation didn't hold, then the code on the right side would be wrong if we use it. Now, if the speculation was right, if the new input we got also has that shape that we've always seen in the past, then the next instruction is MOV, that's a move. And here we're moving the value of x into to the RBX registry. So because this object always has a specific shape, the compiler actually knows where to find the value in memory. So it's a simple move to get to the X property. It's not looking it up on a prototype chain and checking if it's a proxy and all these things. It's just like, oh, it's over here. I'm going to move it in my register. And then the last line, ADD, it's addition. We're adding one to the X value. So this is how you go from hundreds of instructions to four instructions, because um, assuming that you always get similar looking input. Um, and just saying, pointing out, it's similar looking input. It's always different numbers that we had. It's not the same input that you could cut just cache. Oh, it's always 42 plus 1. No, it's different integers in this object, but we can use much simplified instructions. 
All right, so here's actually a graph um, turning off TurboFan, turning off this optimizing compiler that we had on the right-hand side of the diagram. So here I'm running node with a special flag that says dash dash no opt, so TurboFan is turned off. So everything happens just with the baseline compiler on the left-hand side. And you can tell now that JavaScript is incredibly slow. So this is pre-crankshaft. This is what JavaScript looked like before 2010, before Chrome added the optimizing compiler, and then the other browsers joined even later. Um, and so in this graph, you see it goes up to 80 seconds versus C plus versus now it's like less than 20. So you can imagine if you have a big React application or a Node.js server, if everything would be that much slower, we would never have those big applications in JavaScript. And this one here, this is my favorite graph because you can you can see the optimizing compiler here. So this is um, with the optimizing compiler, the same graph we saw before, but zoomed in to the first 200 prime numbers. And you see at the beginning, JavaScript is super slow. Like at the beginning, it looks like we had turned off the optimizing compiler. And in fact, when you calculate the first prime numbers here, the optimizing compiler is turned off because no function is hot yet. Nothing is being done by the optimizing compiler. So the baseline compiler just computes prime numbers, but really, really slow compared to C++. And then you have a bunch of spikes there. That's where the optimizing compiler is recompiling the function because at some point we've run it a ton of times and the baseline compiler says, hey, this function is hot. We should really do something about it and generate machine code that's faster. And then you can see around the first 100th prime number, that's when the optimizing compiler is done generating a new set of machine code, and now we're using that machine code, and it's just so much faster than what we would have otherwise. So I really like this because it shows in the data that, yes, in JavaScript, we have optimizing compilers that need some feedback from the runtime before they can kick in and do something good. All right, so where does WebAssembly fit into this performance comparison? First of all, what is WebAssembly? Who has heard of WebAssembly? Okay, so I like to say that WebAssembly is a portable binary format for the web. Portable means um, it runs independent of the operating system and the processor. Binary format means it's not a format we can write, it's a binary format that machines can read and write. And for the web means it runs in the browser. So um, we used to have only JavaScript as a dynamic language in the browser, now we also have WebAssembly. What's really nice about WebAssembly is that it's supported by all the big browser vendors. They all came together and they agreed to work on a specification together and to implement according to the spec. So the big advantage is if you do ship any WebAssembly code, you don't have to worry what browser your clients are using. There are a few browser features that got developed in only one or two browsers and they were great features, but we could just never use them because they were not supported in all browsers. So with WebAssembly, it's really nice that the browser vendor said, okay, Okay, Microsoft, Google, Safari, Firefox, we work together, we agree on a specification, so if anybody ships WebAssembly, it just works. Um, it also runs in Node.js, and as I said, it's a binary format. We don't write it. Instead, we write in a different language and then compile to WebAssembly. So the um, the MVP product of WebAssembly supports C, C++, and Rust, but there's um, experimental compilers where you can do Java or Lua or Go or a bunch of other languages, and you can compile a Go program to WebAssembly. And that's also really important. There is debugging support for it, because even though your C++ program might have worked, by the time you compile it to WebAssembly and ship it, you're going to get bugs in production, so then you're happy that you can debug the WebAssembly. OK, how fast is WebAssembly? So I took my C++ code, I compiled it to WebAssembly. I didn't have to implement this algorithm again, I just compiled it to WebAssembly and then timed it. And WebAssembly is between C++ and JavaScript performance. It's very close to native C++ performance. It's a tiny little bit slower just because there's a bit of overhead calling in and out of WebAssembly. 
So what can we take away from this? Modern JavaScript is really, really fast. Yes, it's a scripting language. Yes, it's dynamically typed. And yes, it's not as fast as C++. But for the vast majority of use cases, it's incredibly fast. So unless you do something where you have a ton of computation in a browser, like gaming, virtual reality, something like that, it's probably doesn't really make a difference to you how that little bit of performance difference that you have between C++ and JavaScript probably doesn't affect your users um, because they are slowed down by an image or a font that they are loading. So if you can, um, both in Node and in the browser, I would stay with JavaScript because it's just nice to have one language. A, you only need one syntax. You can, you don't need to hire people that know both both languages. But it's not only the syntax, it's all the tooling, um, it's, it's the build pipeline, the linting, the IDE, all that. It's just a lot easier if you can stay with your one language. Um, native C++, yes, yeah, it's, it's faster than JavaScript, but depending on what you do, it's just a factor of two. It's not like 10 years ago where it was a factor 80 and it really made a difference. Now, WebAssembly is great in the web. If you do have those applications that are really computation heavy in the front end, you can use WebAssembly. Um, obviously, you can't use C++, so it's not that it's not great in the web, it's just not there. But WebAssembly is a great addition to JavaScript in the web for those kind of use cases. Um, and again, my warning, don't blindly optimize, measure first before you decide to make any changes based on how just-in-time compilers run and also what language you're using. That was it. Um, enjoy the gambling, I guess. Thank you. <laughs>